manifested. <laughs> and the entrance of his word brings light. So tonight, Father, bring your light, shine it on us. Give us this day our daily bread. So all over this room, all over this building, on the live stream, come and help me welcome Paul Edet. Come on, help me welcome this man of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and take your seat. Go ahead and take your seat. Um, I say this all the time, but um, I will start here. Acts chapter 2. In the middle of a revival. In the middle of a place where people were encountering Jesus, where the Holy Spirit fell upon his people and people were speaking in other tongues and you know signs wonders miracles were taking place Peter stood in the middle of a revival and preached God's word where people might have seen it as a break <laughs> where people might have seen it as this is something that you don't do in the midst of revival. But I believe strongly that if we are going to not just sustain, hallelujah, <laughs> not just sustain what God has done in this room, but also continue to live that out in our very lives, we have to understand his truth. We have to understand who he is. If we struggle to understand who he is, let me tell you what will happen. You will fall in love with the idea of God without falling in love with his person. And so moments like this, it's so vital that we add language to what God has done and what he's doing. Otherwise, you will become like the Pharisees that searched through the very scriptures but missed the person. When you go through life constantly desiring the experience without knowing the person, then you have sold yourself short because the experience comes from him. The experience comes from his person. Something that we say all the time at Numa House is his presence is his person. Because oftentimes the idea is that if I experience his presence, it's almost like a, 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 a rushing wind, a fire. Some of you have experienced power, you've experienced all of this stuff, but understand that these things, these experiences, these feelings, they carry the nature and the heart of the person. They carry the nature and the heart of the person. John chapter one, verse four, it says, in him was life and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. For some of us, we go to the darkness has not overcome it without understanding that in him is life. In him, in his person is everything you could ever desire, is everything that you could ever need, is everything that you could ever long for. It's in him. It's in him. And I'm sorry if I bore you. <laughs> it's uh, about 3 a.m. Um, and normally at this time, <laughs> I don't normally preach at this time. I'm normally speaking and praying against demons. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> but I hope in this very few time, in this very short time, that you would allow me to journey with you. That you would allow me to help you understand what God has for you to understand. Remember this, 
that in this moment, as you're listening to God's word, as you're listening to his truth, you still have the responsibility to keep yourself aware of God. Don't think that this is a break. Don't think that, okay, um, it's time for the word. Let me just take a back seat and just rest from all the activity. But understand that God is in this. God is in this. God is in this. I am a man under authority. And not just the authority of God. <laughs> you know, only, only God can tell me what to do. Um, but not just under the authority of God, but under the authority of a father that I drink from, that I eat from. And so please, I want us to honor him again. Is that okay? So can we be on our feet? And can we honor my spiritual father, Pastor Nee Annam? God bless you so, so much, sir. God bless you. God bless you. You can go ahead and take your seats. As Patrick always says, the honor has been honored. <laughs> Jude chapter 1. Turn with me there. Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. And if you don't know where Jude is, it's just before Revelation. Jude chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 17 to 25, and I'm reading from the ESV. Jude chapter 1, verse 17 to 25. I'm reading from the ESV. It says, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time there will be scoffers following their, their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear hating even the garment stained by the flesh now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. If you're making notes, I want you to touch the neighbor next to you and tell them the title of my message, which is Deceptive Seasons. Deceptive Seasons. So firstly, understand this, that when we're looking at the book of Jude, Jude is writing to a Christian audience, and he's telling them to contend for their faith. Jude, and, and follow me here, I love to paint a picture so that you can understand everything that God has for you to understand. Jude is writing to a Christian audience, and he's telling them to contend for their faith. He tells them to contend for the faith because there are false teachers among them who are perverting the message of grace and using it as a license to continue with sin. They say, because God has forgiven me, because God has redeemed me, because God is a merciful God, I can carry on living a life of sin and then turn back and ask for the same mercy without a desire to change. And the issue Jude is highlighting is that grace should not be used as a license to sin and that his worry is that this perverted, this perverted grace culture would spread amongst all of Jesus' followers. So he's warning them. 
can I share with you this harsh truth? As a generation, this is what we faced. As a generation, we went through this same thing. And I'm going to help you understand this. During 2020, we saw a rise of the understanding of grace as the pardon for sin, but not the enablement to live a holy life. The kind of grace that's shown in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. And it says this, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. So 2020 was a year where we fully understood the grace of God brings salvation for all people. That the grace of God has pardoned me. That the grace of God um, has brought about mercy within my life. But look at verse 12. It says this, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. So as a result of our partial understanding of grace during 2020, 2021, as a generation, we were under attack. As a generation, we saw an increase in weakness, an increase in tiredness, an increase in addiction, an increase in sin, an increase in people leaving the, the church community. Why? Because we saw grace as the pardon for sin, but we refused to see it as the enablement to live a holy life. This is where we have been. We've seen people who are strong become weak. We've seen people turn on the very thing they once possessed. We've seen people become tired of trying to be the person God has called them to be. We've seen people flirt with sin or some even get stuck in it. Did someone just say sneaky link? <laughs> <laughs> you almost had me there. I won't, I, I won't be dragged in. <laughs> and so what God did, what God has done over this year is in his kindness, he's brought about movements like wildfire and other young ministries and even erected new churches to carry the assignment of building people up again. Being led by God... These camps have brought to our attention our struggle with sin and our lack of strength to continue being the people God has called us to be. There has been atmospheres for deliverance, freedom and strength. So much so that we've become a people whose eyes are on our ability to walk correctly. And we're understanding something. We're understanding the need to live a holy life. We're understanding the need uh, uh, to, to be free from, uh, to walk free from sin. We're understanding what, what God has for us to understand. But this has been the issue. Now that the enemy has realized that we're emphasizing the standard of our walk, he's found a new strategy. And this is where the title of my message comes in. Deceptive Seasons. This is what the enemy says. If I can get them to place all their focus on their inability to walk uprightly, I will keep them in circles of shame, guilt, and condemnation so that they would never get to focus on their savior. If I can't get them to take up that sin again, I'm going to make them so sin conscious that they now no longer enjoy their relationship with God. And so every time they come before me, they're asking for mercy. Every time they come before me, they're asking for deliverance. Every time they come before me, they're asking for freedom. 
and they've made my relationship with them sin focused and sin centered instead of being savior focused and savior centered and so the enemy says if I can't get them to pick up the things that they once struggled with I'm going to keep them in a place where they are so they are so focused on 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 getting this walk right that they don't enjoy me Some of you, as Emmanuel Smith was ministering, you did not know what to do because you're so used to an atmosphere of deliverance that you don't know how to enjoy God. You're so used to an atmosphere of breaking chains that you no longer know how to come before God and just enjoy him. Your relationship with God has become sin-focused. It's become one that whenever you come before God, it's always to discuss my weakness. It's always to discuss what I'm going through. It's always to discuss, God, this is why life is so hard and these are my pains right now. And there is space for that. But understand something, that what you're doing is you're coaching yourself, you're coaching your relationship with God to be all about you. To be all about what I go through. To be all about my sin. God, I struggle with this. I I struggle with that. And what you've done is you have settled for a lesser uh, experience of what God has for you. You've settled for a lesser experience of what God might have for you in your relationship with him. For some of us, our walk is filled with sin, PTSD, that you no longer enjoy God. Life has become a means of treading carefully. And so some of you will leave here and you're like, okay, God, I've got my deliverance. Let me now be very, very careful with what I do. And let me live a life where... I'm worried that I might fall. My worry is in the center of my mind. So let me tread carefully and let me just try and walk holy. Let me just try and live a holy life. And the issue with that is in what Jude chapter 1 verse 20 to 21 says. This is what it says. After Jude has said to these Christians that there are a bunch of people that don't practice what they teach. There are a bunch of people who don't practice what they preach. And then this is what Jude says from verse 20 to 21. It says, but you. Turn to your neighbor and say, but you. It says, but you, beloved. Build yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Can I tell you the way to truly live a life where you can walk free from sin and enjoy God? It's by being built up in Jesus. And so what God is trying to do is he's trying to ask you the question, is what I have for you, can it it go past tonight and can it follow you into your daily life? So that when you come to a moment like this, Your cry isn't just, God, free me, but your cry is, God, I love you. Jude highlights these two things. That you have to be built up in your most holy faith. Faith is your belief or your trust in God. 
And so it's your ability to say, God, I believe you are who you say you are, and I trust that you will do what you said you are going to do. And then it goes on to say that you have to pray in the Holy Spirit. Praying in the Spirit is engagement with God. It's allowing your mind, it's allowing your life to be one that is forever available for God, that is forever engaged with him. Understand this, that when the Bible says pray without ceasing, it does not mean that you must go around Tesco speaking in tongues. <laughs> I know some of you are holy. But understand that when the Bible says pray without ceasing, what it's saying is engage with God, be readily available and engage with him. That as you engage with him, if he is to speak, whatever decision or action that you make, it's done in light of who he is. Why? Because you've engaged with him. And so after Jude highlights all these things that these, these, these teachers who are not practicing what they preach, it, he tells you, be built up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. And then it says, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. After Jude highlights the sin that's going on in the community of believers, he then says, okay, you be built up by focusing on God. Be built up by focusing on God. And the deception behind sin and behind trying to avoid sin is that it tells you it has to be your only focus in order to get rid of it. What sin will tell you is focus on me so that you never get into it again. And the deception behind that is it, it, it bombards your mind and keeps your mind under bondage to the point where your only focus is not slipping up. Your only focus is not repeating that thing. Your only focus is trying to live a life holy and trying to walk holy before God. But I want to show you what James chapter 4 verse 7 says. It says this, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have to understand the submission to God comes before resisting the devil. And so you're busy focusing on sin. You're busy focusing trying to live a holy life that you've realized that you have not engaged with the Savior. You have not enjoyed him. And from the place of enjoyment, then you can walk free. From the place of enjoyment, from the place of enjoying him, from the place of enjoying who he is, of engaging with him, only then can you walk free. But friends, you will not be able to walk free if you are sin conscious. You will not be able to walk free if your only focus is treading lightly and treading carefully. But your focus has to turn from your sin to the Savior. Because when your focus is on him, when your eyes are on him, you have no room to see anything else. When your eyes are fixed on Jesus, you have no room for anything else. Why? Because everything is done in light of him. As I engage with him, as I build myself up, as I pray in the spirit, you have to understand that as you do these things, that you are causing your eyes to be fixed on no other. Our issue is not that we're terrible people. Our issue is that we haven't focused on God enough. I'm telling you. Because let, let me tell you what will happen. You'll come next month. You already know what I'm about to say. God deliver me. 
God set me free. And you don't understand that in accordance to Ephesians chapter 1, when it says that all heavenly, all, all blessings in heavenly places has been given to those who are in Christ Jesus, you have to understand that that includes freedom. That that includes deliverance. And so where the war is right now is in your mind. That if you are born again, the war right now is believing and trusting that what he said is true. And so what we do is with sin conscious, we become very sin conscious and it, and it begins to strip us of our identity in him. It begins to make us those who now we begin to speak things that he has not spoken over us. Why? Because what sin does is it causes you to forget who you are in him. It causes you to take your eyes off him and focus it on your ability to walk. But my Bible tells me that you first must submit to God then resist the devil and he will flee. The resisting of the things that constantly come up within our lives is found in our ability to submit to God. What did Jesus say? Two commandments, I leave you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. As you focus on who Jesus is and what he has said. Let me tell you this. Your prayers will change from God free me, God deliver me, uh, God if you would just stop this thing that continues happening within my life. Your prayers will change from that to now you will be in a place where you can enjoy who God is. I love it said like this, Jesus didn't die just to free you from sin. Okay, Jesus didn't die for you to just escape hell. Jesus died so that you would become everything that he is and that from that place you would enjoy him. The one thing that Jesus is looking for, and I'm so happy that Tyron said it, is lovers. But some of us are trying to be kingdom shakers, and we have not been lovers. Some of us are trying to be hell shakers. Hell hears your prayers more than Jesus does. Constantly binding the devil. Constantly, I bind, I loose, I cast. But can I tell you this, that when you're following Jesus, you've eliminated or removed yourself from following anything else. So that means that if you want to if you want to get free from all that stuff, if you want to continue walking free, follow Jesus. Follow him. There is no space between trying to walk free from stuff and then trying to walk in him. But if you walk in him, you are of him. And if you are of him, you are not of anything else. And so you are, you are removed from every other idol, every other lover, every other thing that stood and, and looked bigger than who he is. That when he stands and you extol him and you bless him and you give him his worth, what happens in that moment is an exchange begins to happen. Where now you identify by him and not your sin. When now you identify by who he is and not the thing that you once struggled with. I love how Jude chapter one, <laughs> there's only one chapter. <laughs> but verse 24 says this. 
now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Hear this. And to present to you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. For some of us, we think that Jesus is in heaven complaining at the fact that he had to redeem us. We see God like, uh, whenever, whenever we, we come in moments like this, we see God saying, we, we feel like God is saying, uh, not you again. I have to redeem. I have to, I have to set free again. When will you break free? But it says here, he presents you faultless before the presence of his glory. What? With exceeding joy. Which means that he's happy to stand in the place of every arrow. He's happy to stand in the place of that thing that's trying to strip you of the identity that, he ha- that you have in him. He's happy when he stands in front of that. And he says, no, 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 this one is mine. This one is from me. And so God stands in exceeding joy. Why? Because he presents us faultless. That he says, I no longer see you by what you've done, but I see you as I see myself. You know how big that is, right? You know how crazy that is? That God himself would say, I am glad to see you how I see myself. It's beautiful when you get to a place where your worry is no longer sin. Hear me. Because for too long, because of our spirals, we said, okay, God, my Christian life will be successful if I just walk correctly. <laughs> Some of us, we've said that my Christian life will be successful if I am just able to walk correctly. But understand that the success of your Christian life never came from you. The success of your Christian life was found in his work. The success of your Christian life was found in his ministry. And so what you do is you begin to believe and trust that as he's done that thing, he has empowered me to walk how he walked. And that's how you find yourself in a place where you can walk free. Not by focusing on trying to live right. For some of us, we're walking on eggshells because we don't want to go back to the 2020 us. We're scared. And so if I just come and I continue to get prayer, then maybe I won't go back to the person I was. Understand this, that God's, God's strategy for you to live a holy life is not fear. God's strategy for you to live a holy life is not fear. He doesn't scare you into submission. Tell me where you find that in the scriptures. I'll drop the mic right here. He doesn't scare you into submission. What does he do? He says, look at me. See all that I am. Find yourself in me and now walk. See all that I am. See my character, see my nature. See the way I responded to those who were sick. See the way I responded to those who society cast away. See the way I responded in in moments of temptation. Stand and see what I've done. Now see yourself in me and now walk. Don't allow your fear to live a holy life, to, to, to lead you back to having the law as your master. Don't allow your fear 
to lead you back where you say, Moses is my redeemer. But we have Jesus, who not just pardons us, but enables us to walk free. The truth is, a lot of people are broken in this very room and throughout our generation. We're in limbo, where we're trying to live a godly life, but we're dealing with stuff. You have to understand something. That your ability to go through that season is found in seeing him. If you can see him, you see him for all that he is, and you see yourself. And then you can walk. Then you can walk. This is what God helped me understand. That the focus is him. That your focus is to be on the one who is able to keep you from falling. I love that Jude ends this way. Because after talking about all the, 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 the teachers that were not living what they spoke about, what they taught, Jude then says, hey, okay, you build yourself up in your most holy faith, pray in the spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. And then it ends with, but now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. Your focus should be him. Your focus should be him. And I don't want anyone in this room and those even watching online to fall into this deception that a successful Christian life is one that is sin conscious. No, 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 no. A successful Christian life is one that fixes his eyes on Jesus, that sees Jesus, that focuses on Jesus. This is the truth that that God wants us to understand. That if we are going to be people who leave this place and we are able to walk free, we have to be people who see him, who our focus is on him. But I want to do something right now. And don't worry, I'm not going to get sounds of intercession and have us blast in tongues. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one call. And I'm going to ask that we intercede concerning the people that come. Now, please hear me. This call isn't, if you're really struggling with stuff, come forward. Because, hey, we'd all be up here. Right? This call is specifically for those who have a pastoral ministry. For those who they feel God has called them to walk in the pastoral office. And by no means is this uh, uh, officiating you to be whatever. But we're going to pray for you. The reason why we're going to pray is because we need you. We need you. We have seen the rising of the prophetic movement. We have seen the rising of the evangelists. We have seen the rising of the apostles. We have even seen the warring between teachers. But one thing that people refuse to acknowledge is the pastoral ministry. And you have to understand something. You are not a pastor because you lead a church. You can be a prophet and lead a church. You can be an apostle and lead a church. Stop putting pastor by their name just because they lead a church. You are a pastor because you have the ministry to care. You have the ministry to prune. Where other people would walk past, you have a ministry to sit with an individual. There are things that prophets are not bothered about in the personal lives of people that irk pastors. And so I want to make this call Because for those who who God has called within the pastoral ministry, we need you. As a generation, we need you. Why? 
because we're seeing words being brought forward. We're seeing ministries being built. We're seeing souls being saved. We're seeing people being taught doctrine, but no one is walking through the lives of these individuals. No one is walking alongside these people. As a generation, we have people who have come out of sin cycles and are confused about how to move on from life. And pastors, we need you. We need you. And so I'm going to call you. If you know that God has called you within the pastoral ministry, and it's not something that you're operating in now, run up here, right this very second. Run up here in this moment. Because what God wants to do is we are going to intercede for you. No one is going to lay hands on you. Don't worry. No one's going to fall by the grace of God. <laughs> But we are going to intercede for you. Why? Because we need you. Pastors, hear me. We need you. We have a whole generation of people that are struggling. We have a whole generation of people that are fighting with identity crisis. We have a whole generation of people and we've placed too much burden on the prophets, but not enough burden on the pastors. Pastors, there are things that you see within church that annoy you. There are things that you see and there are, things, there are ways that people are treated within Christian spaces that bother you, but you feel like I'm not in a position to open up my mouth and say something. We need you. As a generation, we're facing a lot. Young people have come from a very confusing year, from a very confusing two years, and we faced a lot. We've heard the word go forward. We've released those that would preach the gospel to the lost. We've, we've wrestled with can you call God down and can you not? We've done all this stuff, but the one office that has not been emphasized is the pastoral ministry. Pastors, we need you. Leaders like me are struggling. Leaders like me are fighting with our own stuff. And we need you. We need you. We need you to care. We need you to prune. Where other people will push aside, where other people will say, that's just life, deal with it. We need you to walk alongside us. The success of the rest of this year, and I believe this strongly, and the year to come is found in the strength of the pastoral ministry. This isn't something you hear a lot, but we are in need of your ministry. And so all over the room, can we stand? And I want us to intercede concerning these people. Realize that all over this room, you are in need of the ministry that is inside of them. You are in need of the expression of Jesus that would go to the house of the sinner and would break bread and would eat with and would begin to care. Understand this, that we need to be cared out of some stuff. We've been rebuked for far too long but now we need to be cared out of some stuff. We've picked up things that are not of God and we have questions and we are confused and we need those who are gonna hold our hands. All over this room, I want you to stretch your hands to these and I want you to begin to intercede. I want you to pray that God would build up the pastoral ministry that where these 
have been scared to operate in their function, where these have been timid to operate as the people God has called them to be. God, we intercede concerning them. And just have you just as you have said in Jude chapter 1, that you said we are to be built up in our most holy faith. Help them to believe and trust that they are who you said they are. Help them to believe and to trust that you have placed inside of them everything that they are in need of. I thank you that as the Son of Man lives within them, they have the capacity to care. They have the capacity to hold the hand of the sinner. They have the capacity to carry the burdens of people. These have the capacity to cause, to be a a shoulder that people can lean on. A shoulder that leaders can cry on. A shoulder that pastors, the leaders of churches, the apostles, the prophets can come and can rest their chest on these ones. Thank you that you've made them a transparent people. And I thank you that as they model transparency, that they might cause a generation to open up about their struggle, that they might cause a generation to open up about their weakness, where people are too scared to go to other offices because they're feared of being called out. Pastors, be built up, be available, be available that the people, that a generation can cry on you, that a generation can lean on you, that a generation can depend on you. Pastors, I quicken you now in the name of Jesus that you will carry the mantle of God where you have been silenced by the prophetic ministry, where you have been silenced by the apostolic ministry, where you have been seen as a lesser function, as a lesser office, I pull you higher now. I pull you higher now. I pull you higher now. That the ministry that prunes, the ministry that is in accordance to John chapter 15 verse 15. I thank you that you're causing these to prune the branches so that we might be a fruitful generation. And where you feel like you can not be a caring hand for someone else because you never received care. There are some of you who have lacked fathers, who have been ruined by mentors, who have been messed around by so-called Christian friends, that now you are saying, how could I possibly care for people when I wasn't cared for? understand something that Jesus cared for you that Jesus cared for you and so I come against every lie that comes to tear and eat away at the pastoral ministry and where you have felt like I have not been fathered, I have not been mothered, I have not been cared for, my parents didn't even look after me. God, I thank you now for freedom. I thank you now for liberty. I thank you, God, for the ability, God, to understand and to see that you cared for them. That you cared for them first before anything that you cared for them first Father I refuse the lie that where some have grown up fatherless I refuse the lie that tells them that they are fatherless but I declare right now let their strength be found 
in seeing your ability to father them. Let your strength be found in seeing his God's ability to care for you, to father you, to be there for you. He says, I have been consistent, that I have never missed a moment in your life, that where you struggled, I've been there. And now God is pushing you into a place that you will now begin to walk as the function God has assigned you to. That you would now begin to walk within the gifting. Some of you have been frustrated with yourselves because you have not seen caring for people as a gift. And so you said, I'm useless in church spaces. I don't have much to offer because I've just got a really big heart. And God says, that's your ministry. That's what I've assigned you to do. And so I release that over you and every broken place within your life where you felt like I'm giving out of an empty glass. I pray that God would fill it that God would fill it, that he would open your eyes and help you to see that God has been with you. In the precious name of Jesus. I want us all to do something in this room. Pastors, turn. Turn around and face the congregation. I want everyone in this room to find someone at the front and give them a hug because those who care for people need to be cared for. So pastors, we celebrate you. The ministry to prune, the ministry to care for, we celebrate you and we care for you. We care for you. We care for you. The way you felt like you haven't been cared for, we care for you and we tell you we're here for you. We're here for you. We're here for you. There's something special that happens when there's unity in the room. You guys can go ahead and take your seats, take your seats. Come on, can we just honor the man of God, Paul? Come on, honor him.